Thanks for joining us. I'm Shay McAllister. Doug Profit's off tonight. The Office of Inspector General held its first Community Policing Council tonight. The hope is the community will weigh in on what they want to see from officers working in their neighborhoods. WHAS 11's Taylor Woods and photojournalist Ian Hartwood were there talking to community members who did show up. And Taylor, how are they feeling after this meeting? Well, Shay, those community members tell me this community policing meeting is the first step in the right direction to better relationships between the community and LMPD. Inside the Portland Community Center, concerned residents in Louisville Metro Police Department's first division are sharing their concerns with the Office of Inspector General. Is it your, within your scope to then go and investigate the other officers and ask why? The goal to improve the relationship between the community and police. And maybe to help us solve some of the solutions, some, some of the problems that we've been having in the city of Louisville between um, Metro government and the Metro police for years. Inspector General Edward Harness brought the idea of community policing councils from his tenure working under the Albuquerque, New Mexico Police Department. The first round of meetings focused on learning what the community wants to see and how they can work with his office. When we file a complaint, you know, you have to file a complaint. That was the main thing. I don't know if people took that away from it, but you have to file a complaint. You have to put it on paper. Harness says LMPD was invited to tonight's meeting, but did not attend. It's uh, disappointing that uh, the department uh, didn't take advantage of this opportunity to engage with the public. In a statement, the department said, quote, we appreciate the OIG's efforts at implementing the measures he deems necessary to assist with moving forward towards ensuring constitutional policing and strengthening police community relationships. They go on to say LMPD supports the OIG's initiatives and the work of his office for a better Louisville. We look forward to more opportunities to continue working with community partners in the future. Not all of the officers are the ones that are the problem. Residents in Harness feeling encouraged by the first meeting. They stated they were going to make suggestions to the department so to implement different things to make it better so the community can see it. As they look ahead to making positive change. Well, it tells me that there's still a lot of unanswered questions, uh, but there's a willingness to listen and to participate. And uh, that's what we need. And the Office of Inspector General plans to have community policing meetings in all eight LMPD divisions. The next meeting is Thursday, June 22nd in the 8th Division. In studio, Taylor Woods, WHAS 11 Night Team on your side. All right, Taylor, thank you very much. New tonight, the family of LMPD officer Nick Wilt says he is making remarkable improvement in therapy. In a post on the Metro Police Foundation Facebook page, Officer Wilt's family says his speech is improving, adding he's even making jokes. They say he's also making progress when it comes to standing and walking. Officer Wilt was shot in the head on April 10th while responding to the mass shooting at Old National Bank. He spent several weeks in the hospital before moving to a rehab facility. Nearly two weeks after a shooting inside the Mall St. Matthews sent one person to the hospital, police have announced an arrest in that case. St. Matthews police arrested 21-year-old Trayshawn Fowler Milan this afternoon on charges of assault and wanton endangerment. According to an arrest citation, he admitted to the shooting. Investigators say Fowler Milan fired three rounds while inside the lid store at the mall. One of those hit another man, another went to the floor, and another was fired toward the Dillard's entrance. Police Chief Barry Wilkerson says investigators believe it was an isolated incident between people who knew each other. You know, it's sad today that this can happen anywhere. Uh, uh, but I do, you know, again, want to let the public know that we do look at these uh, very seriously. Uh, we do take these crimes very seriously in St. Matthews. Uh, you know, we're not known for our violent crime, and we don't wish to be known for our violent crime. Chief Wilkerson there says they believe they have everyone involved in that shooting accounted for. A man has taken a plea deal in the 2020 murder of his stepfather and attempted murder of his mother. The Commonwealth's attorney says Ben Sandusky pleaded guilty but mentally ill in the case. The crime happened at the family's Lake Forest home in October of 2020. As part of the police, Sandusky admitted to stabbing and shooting his stepfather, Arthur Brown, following an argument. Prosecutors say he also tried to shoot his mother, but no bullet fired from the gun. As part of the police, Sandusky was sentenced to 27 years without the possibility of parole. Former President Donald Trump landing back in New Jersey tonight following an unprecedented day in U.S. history. 
Trump becoming the first former president to be arrested and arraigned on federal criminal charges. In Miami federal court, Trump's attorney entered a not guilty plea, all on two 37 counts of the indictment. Prosecutors allege he mishandled classified documents, some of which contained national defense secrets. ABC's Rena Roy has his message after the arraignment. Just hours after he was arrested and fingerprinted electronically, former President Donald Trump back in front of a crowd of supporters maintaining his innocence. Today we witness the most evil and heinous abuse of power in the history of our country. Very sad thing to watch. Trump speaking at his golf club in Bedminster, New Jersey, flying there after his arraignment in Miami federal court, where he spent about an hour inside a courtroom, mostly staring at the floor, slumped over in his chair with a stern face and not uttering a single word. His attorney, Todd Blanche, entering a not guilty plea on behalf of Trump to all 37 federal counts, some potentially carried decades in prison if the former president is convicted. Special counsel Jack Smith, who led the investigation, sitting just one row behind Trump, has accused Trump of illegally keeping sensitive classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago resort, in a storage area, a ballroom, and even a bathroom. They allegedly included secrets about United States nuclear programs, potential vulnerabilities of the United States and its allies to military attack, and plans for possible retaliation in response to a foreign attack. Trump's co-defendant, one of his closest aides, Walt Nauta, has also been charged, accused of conspiring with his boss to obstruct the investigation, though he didn't enter a plea because he didn't have local counsel to represent him. USA! Outside the courthouse, protesters from both sides gathering throughout the day. Food for everyone. Food for everyone. After the hearing, Trump stopped at a local Cuban restaurant to greet supporters. The former president has been barred from speaking to any witnesses about the case except through counsel. Nada is set to return to court later this month. Rena Roy, ABC News, Miami. The former president didn't take a mugshot and wasn't handcuffed today, but he was processed like any other criminal defendant. Fingerprinted, and he had to give his name and social security number to authorities. Back here at home, the Louisville Urban League is asking a judge to dismiss a lawsuit filed by its former president. Kishkumi Price filed the lawsuit after she was fired, claiming she was fired as retaliation after she uncovered financial wrongdoing. The original lawsuit alleges the Louisville Urban League misused grant money in more than one instance. But today, the Urban League filed a motion to dismiss the suit. The organization argues Kumi Price didn't cite any specific policy the league violated when they fired her. The league also claims her firing happened before the alleged misconduct was brought up for an audit meeting. Overall, the league is saying there is just not enough evidence to back up her claims. An attorney for Kumi Price tells us he plans to file a response to this motion. It will then be up to a judge to decide whether to move forward or dismiss the suit. Nearly 24 hours after a fire broke out at a Smoketown warehouse, fire crews were still on scene today to prevent hot spots from popping up. While no one was hurt, the building owned by Wayside Christian Mission was destroyed. Grace McKenna went back there today as investigators pieced together how that fire started. That moment of collapse shortly after fire broke out at this Smoketown warehouse and shortly after firefighters left the building. The critical part is for our firefighters to know what kind of buildings they are and what kind of hazards they present. Major Bobby Cooper says crews had that information Monday. In December, fire prevention officials pegged the warehouse used for storage by Wayside Christian Mission as a potential risk. Beyond the fire ground operations is where the life-saving work actually began on this building. Cooper said repairs were underway on dangers like deteriorating structural supports. Right next door, Curtis Taylor of Loaves and Fishes is counting his blessings. Down for right now, you know. Uh, not over, but just down. The nonprofit serves about 100 people out of this building, which is what Taylor was doing right before the fire. I was just here two hours ago uh, getting some food together to take to uh, two, home, two needy families. His building mostly has smoke and water damage, but debris crushed this much used van. I do have total faith. As Loaves and Fishes and Wayside think about the future, fire investigators do too, leaning on nearby cameras, ring doorbells to piece together what happened. When you look at the size of the, the building and the extent of the damage, 
It's just not safe to send humans in there right now. In a city like Louisville, packed with old neighborhoods and old buildings, Cooper says this fire likely won't be the last. And it worked out yesterday in a way that more than likely saved the lives of our firefighters. It's why he says fire prevention laying the groundwork can save lives on the fire ground. In Louisville, Grace McKenna, WHAS 11 on your side. Louisville Fire says when fire prevention officials assess a building, the information they gather is shared with firefighters and MetroSafe through a computer system that allows responding crews to have it on hand when they're called to a fire.